Right. Okay. Uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get going. Uh, my name is Leslie LaMarche. I'm going to be presenting this webinar, and it's a introduction to um, Resin Online, which is a uh, part of the NGO system. Um, this is something that is developed by the NGO team out of SRI International, which consists of uh, Osti Bot, Todd Valentic, uh, Ashton Raymer, Pablo Reyes, and myself. And today we want to introduce you to Resin Online, which is kind of a cloud-based uh, computing environment that lets you easily get started with geospace research. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. See, looking at. Um, so, okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. This is the uh, main NGO website. So Today in the webinar, uh, we're going to kind of go through what the NGO program is to start. Uh, we'll go through how to sign up for an account for the online uh, system. Uh, then we're going to go through signing into your, your account uh, and kind of a tour of the standard Jupyter Lab workspace, working in the console and on notebooks, writing basic uh, scripts and running them. Uh, and then we'll, for the, the second half of this, we're going to talk about uh, what makes this system particularly useful for geospace researchers, kind of go through uh, some tutorials that we've set up that demonstrate how this is useful for geospace researchers, and conclude with uh, what, our, what our goals for this are and what we hope to see the usability is for the future. Uh, so if you have questions throughout any of this, uh, please go ahead and write them in the chat window. Um, other members of the NGO team will try to answer them as we go. And um, if there's anything we need to circle around back to at the end, we're happy to do that and really want this to be a, a open, an open discussion and, and get some feedback from everyone. All right. So um, this is the main NGO webpage. So I said before that this is a NGO project is the Integrated Geoscience Observatory. Um, it's a, a project that is funded by NSF, both for the EarthCube and the Cyber Infrastructure for Sustained Scientific Innovation Programs. Um, and it's the, the main goal of this is to really uh, create a system in which it is possible for uh, geospace researchers to share their work much more easily than they than it currently is and um, reproduce work between done between researchers uh, much more easily than it's currently possible so this is the main website you can see there's some information about uh, the project uh, our two primary goals and um, some of the solutions we've come up to uh, solve this so if you see at the top here, uh, this is resin. So resin online is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and just to see a little bit what it is, it's a very basic sign up. Uh, we've started producing some video tutorials, uh, some YouTube tutorials that you can see on basically just how to get started, uh, what to kind of tour of the workspace, on a, um, a lot of stuff that we're going to go through today as well. Um, and the real advantage to this, so we call it resin, it stands for a reproducible software environment, uh, is to have a system, have a graphic here, that um, kind of uses community tools and uh, well-established methods to create an analysis environment that can easily be shared between different computers, different software systems, different um, users. And part of this is we've created a cloud-based version of this, which is what we're going through today, that is hopefully going to let people really get started quickly with using community toolkits and um, accessing data and 
uh, being able to really get started on their analysis quickly without having to worry about uh, getting started and uh, installation and whatnot. And I'm just going to preview this quickly. You can see this is a current list of packages we have installed in our system that are specific to geospace sciences. Uh, this is obviously something that in future versions we're hoping to expand upon. And we'll get into more of that later. Uh, we also have resources, so just general resources for geospace sciences um, and how to produce reproduce, uh, reproducible research, which will be some, a topic that's covered uh, in our next webinar more and how to contact us, and finally, sign in. So to get started with uh, using the online system, you want to go to the sign-in tab, which is there. So this brings you to uh, the sign-in page. So if you don't have an account, and I know uh, many of you uh, signed up for an account, which is great. If you don't have an account, what you want to do is go to the sign up tab, basically fill out this information and click sign up. When you click sign up, you should get an email in a few minutes. It may take up to 15 minutes to get it, um, depending on spam filtering and whatnot, but uh, that will be an email account activating your account. And then you can go to the login tab and uh, log in using the username and password you set up. So we have an account, so we're going to go ahead and log in. And it takes a few seconds. Uh, then it go ahead, it uh, loads uh, your, your standard workspace. So the first thing you see, you're going to see in your standard workspace is the launcher. Um, the launcher lets you launch Jupyter Notebooks. So both Python 2.7 and Python 3.6 currently. A console, both uh, 2.7 and 3.6, and various other things, terminals, text files, uh, markdown files. Anyway. Um, then over here in this, in this area, we have the, uh, so you have a, a file structure. So you're currently in your, your work directory. Uh, and you can see that we don't have very much in it right now, but these are different files you can click on and open. Um, these buttons at the top here are also very useful. Uh, so the plus opens a new launcher. So it's the same thing that just shows up when you first log in. Uh, that creates, uh, new folder, name it. This button is very useful. This is for uploading files. So if you have files on your own computer, you can upload them into the system and then run them in this system, which is uh, very useful for sharing your work. So let's say you do some work in this system. Uh, you can download the file, email it to a colleague, and they can upload it to their own account and then run it in the exact same environment that you ran yours in and really avoid uh, any issues with um, different versions, different uh, software configurations and all of that. And then this is just a refresh button for the file list. So, yeah, moving on from that, um, we're just going to do kind of a quick overview of what notebooks and the uh, Jupyter console are. This is, um, we're, we're trying to do just a basic introduction here, um, and there's going to be a lot more information uh, that is, um, you can find online and through various tutorials uh, or through asking us. We're very happy to help anyone at any point in time. So console, we click to start a Pi 3.6 console. It'll start, and you can see this is basically just an interactive Python shell. So if you're familiar with using IPython, uh, this should look very, very familiar to you. Um, so we can do this to uh, just do some basic commands. Um, you run cells by clicking shift enter. Uh, and you can do basic arithmetic. 
uh, and this this kind of format it's very useful for uh, testing things, trying things out, trying things out quickly, um, kind of prototyping what what will work. And it's also it's an environment that um, a lot of people are really comfortable working in. Um, so so that's basically what what the console is. Um, it's again it's just a standard uh, Python interface. Python shell interface. So we're going to go ahead and shut that and back to the launcher. So uh, the next thing we want to talk about is these notebooks. Uh, so we're going to launch a Py 3.6 notebook. And um, this is the standard JupyterLab uh, notebook or, or Jupyter notebook. So if you've used Jupyter Notebooks before, again, this should be very familiar to you. So you rename by right-clicking. And you can see that has shown up in your workspace now. So the really powerful thing about Notebooks is that they can be used to embed both um, text and annotations and comments and figures like inline and mixed in with code and plots and um, various other even LaTeX equations, things like that. So you can use them to really kind of document your analysis pretty fully and contain not only your code and analysis, but also a lot of information that helps other people um, guide like uh, guide their way through understanding this and they're becoming increasingly popular um the uh i think i've even heard recently of certain conferences calling making calls for in, um notebooks as abstracts so um and they're they're supposed to be an interactive way where you can not not just share your work through a traditional paper journal but also share your work in a way that other people uh, can modify it or try different things or uh, really understand it and run it themselves. So notebooks are composed of these cells um, and there's three kinds of cells. You change the kind of cell with this button here. They can be a code, which is Python code, markdown, uh, which is kind of just text and just raw uh, text. So we're gonna start uh, with the markdown cell just to put a heading in. And again, you run it by clicking shift enter. So uh, new cells are code by default. And again, you can run it and it produces the output of the code. Uh, right beneath it. So let's say we actually wanted to show a demonstration of a, a trig function. So we're going to first create a markdown cell that says what we're doing. Change that to markdown and shift enter. You can see you have uh, embedded uh, Greek symbols. And then we actually want to run the code. Uh, so this is a standard import statement for, for NumPy, import statement for matplotlib, uh, matplotlib inline. This is um, a special command that you need to use in order to make plots show up in notebooks. Uh, and then create our X and Y array and plot it. And you can see your plot shows up immediately under the, um, the code snippet there. So we have, just to recap our kind of description of what we're doing, the code showing what we did, and then the results of the code. Uh, you can, so these buttons on top, uh, this is save. You can also use a command S or control S. Um, the plus button gives you a new cell. Um, this is cut, copy, and paste. These are useful for if you want to modify code slightly. So let's say I want to copy this and then come down here and paste it. 
Uh, I want to do the same thing, but add something to it. So it's a really useful way to kind of reuse old code and modify it. Um, the, this button is for running. So if I click run, it's the same as shift enter. And then this button for, for restarting the kernel. So um, that basically is gonna restart your session and kind of um, and wipe out any existing variables you have. So uh, sometimes it's a useful thing to do if you've gotten to a place where something isn't working right and you're not sure what, you can restart it and just run through all of your kernels again. Uh, but you should know that after you restart your kernel, um, anything variables that you declare in one cell uh, will still be undeclared in um, cells beneath it. Uh, you can also, one last thing that you can I want to point out that you can do. So this is something that we've run. Uh, you can also make changes to it and run it again. And this is where the interactive nature of it is really helpful for sharing your work with others is because say you, if you've done some analysis, you've created some plots that cover a certain date range and someone else wants to see the same analysis in a slightly different time period or something it becomes very easy for them to adjust that and rerun it themselves without having to kind of redo all of your work from scratch. Um, and that really enhances the usefulness of being able to share your work with others. Um, and the markdown cells. So I went over some very basic kind of uh, things you can do with markdown, but it's, it's really quite powerful. You can embed latex equations, you can create tables, you can embed figures. Um, and there's, there's lots of information online about working with um, Jupyter Notebook Markdown and um, how you can do that in, and really kind of enhance your annotations. Right. So moving on from that, uh, we're gonna talk about scripts quickly. So scripts are useful for code that you reuse often um, or code that is doing kind of long complex calculations that doesn't necessarily need to be fully annotated. Uh, so you can write functions in scripts and then call those functions from notebooks or uh, some people are just more comfortable working in scripts and then running them from a command line interface. Um, so it's just a, a, a third option of how to um, do your work in, in this system. So to write a script, what we're going to do is go to Launcher and create a new test file or, or text file, rename it, uh, so it shows up there. And this script we're going to write something very straightforward. Uh, we want to create a list of the Fibonacci sequence uh, that's less than a given maximum value. So here we have set our maximum value, uh, initialize a list from zero to one, uh, say that the next number in the list is the sum of the previous two numbers. And while that number is less than the max value, you're going to continue adding to the list and then at the end, print it. So we're gonna save it. And then to run it, we're going to go back to the launcher and this time open a terminal window. Uh, so command line interface with terminals, something you uh, may be very familiar with. Um, it's pretty much identical to working with one on a standard um, Unix operating system. So you can see that where it ends you is in home Jovian. And all of your work is in this work directory. So we want to go into work. Uh, and here you can see this is the same list of files that we have over here in our work directory. And we're just going to run this. We're just going to type Python test. 
And that is the results of the code we just wrote up here. Uh, this is, uh, scripts are useful because you can do things like, so I want to do everything below sorry, 500 and then run it again. And as I said before, if you create a, a script that actually contains a bunch of functions, uh, maybe a bunch of read-write functions where you don't necessarily need to or, or want to include all the details of file open close in a notebook, uh, you can then import uh, those functions into a notebook and then use them there. So everything I've talked about so far is, um, Oh, sorry, there's, there's one more thing I'd like to show you about basic notebooks. So over here, we have uh, this tab that shows you which terminal sessions are running. Um, and you can see that the shutdown buttons here let you um, kind of uh, shut down running notebooks. So we're going to go ahead and shut everything down. And close it all. If you go back, uh, you can see that we're still back in our uh, work directory. Um, yeah, so everything I've talked about so far is a very um, just basic Python, Jupyter specific, or not specific, general um, kind of discussion. Uh, this is a, a brief overview. There are lots and lots of uh, resources online about everything that I've talked about that are much more comprehensive. And um, if you contact the NGO team, if you have any questions about any of this, we're also happy to um, help you get started and answer, answer questions you have. Uh, so the next half of this is I really want to talk about what we've done to make this system uh, special for geospace research. Uh, so this, um, this system actually has, in addition to standard, um, like NumPy, SciPy, things like that, uh, a good number of geospace specific uh, um, packages pre-installed in it. So that's going back to here. You see the included packages. This is the list of current. So we have like, things like AACGM, ApexPy, uh, CardoPy is useful for mapping, SciPy, SGP4, various things. Um, so if we were to, again, put a console, uh, we can do things like, uh, so CardoPy is a mapping, ApexPy is magnetic coordinate conversions, and PyGlow is uh, a wrapper around some uh, common uh, models like uh, IRI and um, various other uh, empirical models. And so the advantage to this is that you have now have access to these packages, uh, which are community developed packages, without having to worry about doing the installation system, installation on your own system. And so, uh, and that's, that's actually really cool because a lot of times our community develops uh, packages and develops uh, code for or people in the community for their own use. Uh, but it's sometimes these packages are the easiest to install, especially if they, which is often the case for like the heavy computation stuff you, uh, we have is Python that's wrapped around some um, low level Fortran or the, some um, kind of extensive Fortran model and things like that. So by, by doing that, we can kind of immediately start working with these packages without having to work on installation issues. Uh, so if you go back to this, you can see that uh, we have a lot of things, but it's clearly not everything ever. Um, so this is the first version of this. Uh, we're really excited to add more packages as we need them to kind of continue expanding on this. And this is where we uh, really need the assistance of you and the community is uh, we'd like you to tell us like, okay, what, what are you working on? What do you need to do your work? If you've developed packages of your own that you'd like included, um, just anything that you think would be helpful to really expand on the system. Uh, so uh, for instance, 
Fight Art is something that um, it's the, the, the new uh, Python interface for interacting with SuperDarn data. And it was just released last week. Uh, it's very new, so it's not in this current version, which was released um, a few months ago. Uh, but we're excited to put, have it installed in the next uh, version. We've already started experimenting with that. So um, that should be included in the next version. And in addition to that, we'd like anything else that you tell us, you know, hey, this is something that I use all the time. This is something that's really useful to me. We want to hear about that so we can make sure to include these in sub subsequent versions of resin. The, um, so the final thing that we've done that um, we're hoping really makes this a useful system is we've included a, a number of tutorials in here that um, help you get started with uh, not only just the basic Python and Jupyter interactions, but also um, geospace research. So if you go to examples, and everyone should have uh, the examples directory in their um, workspace, and we go to tutorials. I'm gonna just expand this so you can see it. I have um, it five tutorials right here. So going through these things, we have uh, get started with Python. So open that, select Py36 as the kernel. Uh, and this is a lot of stuff that we've talked about uh, early on today. So just basic printing, arithmetic, lists, data science. Uh, we also have getting started with Jupyter. Six. Again, this is what's in the Jupyter server, what you see, kind of how to interact with it. And both of those are things that we talked about today, but I really encourage you, if you're not familiar with them, to work your way through them, try changing some things, um, and, and see how the differences uh, affect things. Uh, one thing I will caution is that, so we can run these here, uh, but, I'm not sure why that's taking a minute. Uh, and you're, uh, you're welcome to make changes to the code here and try running it. Uh, but this folder uh, is especially mounted to your workspace. So it will um, refresh to each time you log in, it will kind of revert to the, the original tutorials. So if you have changes that you want to kind of persist and continue throughout um, different times of logging and different times of playing this, you should copy these tutorials into your work directory. I'm gonna just stop that for now, actually. So, so the other three tutorials are uh, a little bit more geospace specific. So we're gonna start with this getting started with resin. And this is gonna walk us through a case study It's a bit slow in loading. There we go. Uh, so, right, I'm gonna get started with Fresno. Um, so have a quick uh, introduction, kind of welcome to this package and where you can find more information about it. Um, space science software. So Resin gives you the ability to use common community packages. Uh, so we're going to use PyGlo to try an altitude profile um, of electron densities uh, or over 
uh, the poker plot and coherent scatter radar. So we're going to walk through this and kind of go through just a really basic um, example of what uh, an analysis you might want to do and what you can really start getting doing immediately in here. So I'm going to start that running. And uh, what we did is we uh, specified the latitude and longitude altitude of Pfizer, uh, created a array of altitudes above it, and then used PyGlo, which is one of the community packages we were talk just talking about, to uh, get the modeled IRI densities above it. Okay, so that's another thing. If you click on it, you can actually collapse cells, which is useful if you have large code blocks or things that um, you maybe were trying something, but then don't want to uh, uh, don't want to look at it for a while because um, we all know we have to try things multiple times often. Uh, so we're going to use apex pi to find the magnetic coordinates of visor. That's basic coordinate conversion. Then we're going to calculate densities uh, along the magnetic field line that is set intersects riser instead of just an altitude profile. As you can see, they look very similar, which is reassuring because uh, the magnetic field isn't, um, well, it's off of vertical in the overall zone, but it's not hugely off of vertical. Um, so the next thing we're going to look at is Python APIs for accessing data. We haven't really talked about data much, um, but we are trying to include packages in uh, resin that, I'm just going to get this started while I talk about this, um, that do access to data. So how this works is we currently don't have, the, the, the software environment doesn't have data directly mounted to it, uh, but we have tried to include uh, Python APIs, often APIs provided by the data provider that will let you um, access and pull data from the server, from sites that are, are serving that data. So this first example is shown is uh, using MangoPy. So Mango is an array of all sky imagers over the continental United States. Um, and this software, uh, if you specify site, um, you can get data. So these, uh, these are packages that, so we're trying to include things that are from data providers. If you are a data provider and you don't currently have a Python package that lets you access the data, um, lets users access data, uh, we'd really, um, we'd like to help you get that started or give you some recommendations how to get that started because it really does make it easier for users to then get data and use data and uh, use it in their uh, their research. So the other thing we can do is we can uh, mount our own data. Uh, so we've included a let's go here, data sets. We've included some example data just for you to play with as you're getting started here. Um, uh, you can also, so there's going to be a more advanced use case of using this on your own system in which you can mount your own data. And that's something that, uh, that yes, let's see, that the uh, webinar in four weeks will cover. Uh, but you can also use the upload button that we've discussed about before to kind of upload your data and use it in your system. So we're going to Run that. And here we're going to use H5Py, which is a uh, utility for reading HDF5 files to uh, read Pfizer data, which is in the HDF5 format. So now we're going to use the uh, package to packages included in resin to investigate this Memorial Day storm. So that's the data that we're looking at. Uh, we're going to get density profiles uh, in the vertical, not B beams. Again, using IRI. Or no, sorry, this is reading directly from the Pfizer data. And now we're going to use IRIs through PyGlo to calculate the electron density profiles in both the vertical and the up B beams. So that's currently running the model. So it takes just a few seconds.
And now we're going to plot both the Pfizer density and the IRI density to compare them and see if there are significant differences. All right, so we produce this plot. And here we have the Pfizer electron density. Here we have the IRI electron density. They're on the same color scale. And one thing that's immediately obvious is that the uh, Pfizer has, uh, is showing a lot of electron density at much, both at much higher, um, much higher density and at lower altitudes than uh, what we see in the empirical model IRI. Uh, this is um, not entirely unexpected. IRI is an empirical model, so we don't really expect it to be able to reproduce the results of a, you know, a strong geophysical storm, uh, like the Memorial Day storm as well. And you can definitely see that um, you're having this density probably due to um, precipitation type events um, at, at low altitudes uh, in this kind of very dynamic storm. So that was the vertical. Um, so we're going to compare the up B as well. And you see a very similar story. Again, much higher density, lower altitudes uh, than what can be captured through the empirical model. So one thing we'd like to check is that um, the so we've included some markdown text that kind of explains those results, which is useful if you're going through this on your own. Um, we want to validate that the up B beam does in fact lie similar to the magnetic coordinates that you're uh, the that Pfizer. So uh, the the Pfizer uh, up magnet up B beam is kind of is pointed up along the magnetic field. Uh, but the beam obviously doesn't curve in the magnetic field, so we want to validate that the curve at those altitudes is minimal. Uh, so we're going to, again, find the uh, geodata magnetic field line, and then plot the geodata course of the magnetic field line with uh, the geodata coordinates of the uh, visor beam. Uh, so you can see here that they do diverge, but they diverge by a fraction of a degree in geodetic longitude uh, and geodetic latitude. So we're going to say their agreement is pretty good. Um, the geometric agreement is good. And really this difference is mostly due to um, the fact that really an empirical model, we don't expect it to be able to reproduce strong geophysical events, um, strong geophysical storms. Um, and so this can continue on to various other sets of data, but that's kind of our basic example of this is how we can use this platform to very quickly pull together uh, both models and scientific data and really generate some um, results quite quickly and easily. Um, so the goal here is to really like lower the boundary of entry. So if there's data that you're not familiar with and don't know how to use, um, or not that you don't know how to use it, but you're, uh, to really give you access to it easily and give you tools to work with it easily. Um, so the, uh, now I want to take a minute and just look at this tutorial we have that's called Geospace Packages and Resin. So we have the list on our website of included packages. Uh, but what this tutorial does is it actually goes through every single one of those packages and um, includes some information about what it is, some resources, so the documentation for it and the source code for it. Documentation. It should open the, uh, the documentation tab. And then uh, often a source code snippet. So a lot of this information we've um, we tried to include, include a, a code example with all of them. Some of them it's challenging or not possible to do just because of the, the nature of some of these advanced kind of file IO features and things like that. Um, but the, uh, this should be a good place if you're kind of wondering oh, what is here, what can I work with, what, uh, what can I get started with easily, this should be a good place to go to uh, kind of introduce yourself to what the packages are and what they do. Uh, so just as an example, we're going to look at a few of these. If we go to uh, PANDAS, PANDAS is a high performance, like a, a data analysis, a really advanced data analysis set of tools. 
Um, so you have a link to the site, documentation, you have tutorials. So these are tutorials that are generated by the, wherever possible, we're including um, the, the resources that the package developers have generated themselves. So we want to direct you to what the package developers have said. We've, we've kind of collected all these packages in one place and are trying to make them easy to access and easy to use. Uh, but ultimately, the package developers are the experts on how to use them and how to work with them. So we're trying to direct you to their resources and their tutorials and their um, uh, kind of their documentation about uh, how to use them. You can see that we can run this cell. You can uh, import NumPy and import pandas. And this is basically just a basic example of the pandas series, uh, data frame structure, and creating a data frame structure through a different th list of different things and working with different aspects of the data frame structure. So that's a very powerful tool that a lot of people use. Um, to look at just, so this is something we used in our last one. Uh, this is an Apex Pi example. Again, it's a really fast, useful magnetic field conversion coordinates. So you can go from a particular magnetic field, um, no, sorry, particular geodetic latitude into the magnetic latitude, geodetic latitude. Uh, you can do both arrays and single values as well as calculating MLT. And uh, finally, let's look at SpacePy, which is another really, really powerful, useful toolkit that um, is extremely useful for the geo geoscience community. Um, so one thing in particular I want to point out here is wherever possible, wherever we could find a citation, uh, we've included the citation that the software providers uh, have stated on their website or in their documentation. So if you're using uh, resin to do work and um, from that you generate some results and you put together a, a presentation or a paper, uh, please make sure to cite the software that you use. This is a kind of new thing in our community and we're gonna probably talk about it a lot more in future, um, future webinars. Um, there's still a lot of ambiguity about how exactly you cite software uh, a lot of times journal editors aren't even completely sure yet about how they want to do this and how they want to handle it. But um, if, if a package, particularly if a package includes a citation that they'd like you to use, please do use it so you can give credit to that, uh, those developers and make sure people are aware of all the packages that you have that there are to use. Um, and if a package does not give a citation, uh, please, you know, uh, reach out to the uh, developers and ask if they have a recommended citation or just do, do the best you can to at least acknowledge your use of that package and um, make sure that they get credit for kind of the work they've done to uh, assist with yours. So on um, SpaceFi does many, many powerful things. This is just a basic example of plotting Omni data. So the last thing uh, that I want to show you that I'm not actually going to go through fully, but to at least show you that we have it. Uh, we've included a, a case study. So where this uh, getting started with resin was kind of almost a, a toy example of some um, basic uh, research you could do to, to give you an idea of uh, kind of combining data and models and what this system will allow to do. Um, this is a little bit more of an of a actual substantial data analysis where we find a TID event um, or an LSTID event and you look at data from a number of say, uh, sources, including uh, Madrigal Web. So uh, you look at your geophysical parameters, uh, TEC data. So uh, one of the packages that we, that we include is uh, Madrigal Web, which um, gives you access to the Madrigal, the CDAR Madrigal database, and some FBI data, and really start to draw some conclusions about this event using just the um, resin system and the packages available through it. So that's basically everything I wanted to cover today. Um, just in conclusion, this is uh, the online system. It's a really nice sandbox to kind of get started in and start 
really producing results quite quickly without having to worry about installation and um, different systems and other things like that. Um, there are some limitations in terms of computing power and available memory, but um, hopefully we've provided enough that you can you can get started and and definitely get some results uh, without too much trouble. Um, if you're interested in using this system on your own machine or maybe in a more powerful configuration, uh, we do have a downloadable version, so something we call resin that you can run locally, uh, and that's going to be the topic of the webinar in four weeks. Um, so if you're interested in that, I highly encourage you to attend that. Um, it's, going, it's going to be more advanced usage, but um, we've tried to make it pretty straightforward to digest. And I'd like to kind of end by just reiterating that we really want this to be a useful tool for everyone in the community. So if you see issues with it, if you have features that you'd like and you don't see, um, if there are more packages you'd like, please, please do contact us and let us know and just let us know what are your opinions are and how we can make this better. So uh, you can contact us by, uh, so there's, you can email the email for invitation for this event came. Uh, that's uh, in geo team, geo team at ngeo.datatransport.org. Uh, there's this contact us tab on uh, the website. It again has our email address included in there. Um, and then oops. the other thing you can do is we actually have a, so this is all being developed on GitHub, it's open source. Uh, so if you go to EarthCube and Geo Resin Core issues, uh, you could actually create a new issue um, and say you want to, and this is another place where if you want additional packages or anything like that, please feel free to open an issue and we will happily engage in a conversation with you about how we can make that happen or um, thanking you for the recommendation and saying, yes, we'll certainly add that. Okay, so um, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up if there's any uh, remaining questions. Just gonna open up the chat window here. Does anyone have uh, any comments or questions that they'd like to add at this point? Or uh, looks like we're pretty good. Um, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I think, uh, unless there are additional questions, we're gonna go ahead and end here. Um, again, if you, if you do have questions, if you decide to try this and run into issues or see things that you'd like us to add, uh, please contact us at any time. We're really excited to hear from you and start to actually have uh, people using this and interacting with us. And uh, one final thing, so we have two more webinars coming up. Uh, one is on re reproducibility of research results. So this will kind of be a, a more general, um, not so much about software specific, but more general idea of what do we need to do to ensure reproducibility in geospace sciences? Where do we have poles? Uh, what, what, uh, what can we do to kind of address those and how, how as a, so this is intended to be a dialogue throughout the, through the community more. And then the last one, so that, that one's on Thursday, April 16th, the same time. And then the last one on Thursday, April 30th at the same time is on using resin to create computational reproducer results. And that is going to um, really cover the, uh, yeah, installing the local system and uh, what you do with the local system and how that interfaces with uh, our online system and working with others. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and leave the meeting open for a couple more minutes because it looks like we have a few more chats coming in.
Um, but uh, yes, thank you all for joining. And uh, I, we really look forward to hearing from everyone in, um, in the future as you work with us and have ideas. Uh, yeah, I just unmuted everyone in case anyone wants to actually ask a question, but no. Uh. I see that uh, Aaron asked the question, when I utilize my cloud workspace, is it automatically shared with the community or do you have to do something specific to share? Um, so right now the cloud space isn't shared. Oh yeah, Todd just answered in, tech, in, in chat, but the cloud space isn't shared right now. You would have to, um, as Leslie mentioned, if you go back to the home location or wherever you have your, your notebook, uh, you would have to download it from there to then be able to share it out. Um, yeah, in the future, we're hoping that we can add the functionality to be able to share out the, uh, the actual computational environment, not just the um, notebooks and things that you've done inside of that. So we'll get into, I think in the next webinar, we'll get into more about how you can do a computational reproducible um, research. And then with the offline tool webinar, we'll actually show you how you can take your computational environment and how it's basically automatically portable and you're able to, you know, save that out, put it up on Zenodo so you can cite it in your research or whatever uh, software repository you want to use or just share it with colleagues directly. Um, and the advantage of doing that versus sharing individual notebooks is that Leslie could share that notebook with me, but I don't necessarily have all the same Python packages installed, or I might be running a completely different OS or something. So like the install instructions she would have for running on Mac don't work for Windows or whatever. Um, so if you can share out the entire environment instead, then that's much more portable. Um, it can run on any system. So great, thank you all for joining. And um, please send us your questions, GitHub issues, comments. Hi, Tom. Yes. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Right, as um, Todd mentioned in the chat window, we will be doing time releases of uh, the resin software that will both be available online and the offline that you will get to learn about in four weeks so those of you who are de developers please reach out if you think your software will be useful to the community and would like to make it available through resin some of people like michael hirsch who is already 
and the participants has already done that so thank you um, and we'd like to acknowledge all developers who has who have actually worked on these community tools um, to for other people to use and if there are no more questions we will go ahead and close the um, this webinar right now but do reach out if you have more questions yep. thank you everyone for attending and yeah please reach out if you have questions talk to you soon <laughs>